Okay, hello everybody. Um, I guess in some ways the premise for my talk is kind of similar to the last talk you've just seen. So in Fun, fun with Lambdas, we saw Corey restrict Ruby to just use a subset of the functionality and looked at what this did to the language. And I'm going to do a similar thing. I'm going to restrict Ruby to be a subset of this functionality and see what it means for the way we can use it. Now, I'm not going to use lambdas. In fact, lambdas are going to be banned. I'm going to use some different rules. And as you can maybe guess from the title of my talk, I'm going to turn Ruby into a pure OO version. Now, the inspiration for this came from another talk you've seen in this conference. It was Sandy Metz's excellent Nothing is Something talk. And I saw this talk about six months ago at a conference called Bath Ruby in the English town of Bath. And I was struck really on by this slide. And this is the point where Sandy says that the if keyword is not necessary in Ruby. Now, when I saw this, I thought, this is really weird, what's going on? Because when I think about languages with small syntax, I don't think about small talk. Maybe I should do, but I don't. I think about Lisp languages, and I guess in particular Scheme. Now, if you try and write a Lisp language, you need to get lists working. But after that, there's actually only four things you need to get working. You need to implement these four basic functions. Now, the syntax for Scheme is much bigger, but it, it can all be built out of these four fundamental ideas. And of course, one of these is if. So when I saw Sandy's talk, I was thinking, well, I think if is fundamental to the way programming languages work, so how can you take it out of a language? And it's kind of a shame I was thinking this, rather than just paying attention to the talk where Sandy was explaining how it works. I had to go back afterwards and look at the video. Now, I forgot about this after a while. I mean, there were much bigger ideas in Sandy's talk, and I didn't think about this anymore until a few weeks later when I was creating some content for a company called Pluralsight. Now, Pluralsight do training videos for developers and other technologies. And I'm creating a course for them called Ruby Beyond the Basics. And part of this course is looking at Ruby's object-oriented model. And in particular, I was creating a video that looked at what we might call the primitive objects in Ruby. These are things like numbers and strings and arrays that come built into the language. Now, we often say that these things are objects, and they do kind of behave like objects, and we can send messages to them. But they're special kind of objects, and they're special because they've got special local state. So to understand this, let's look at an example. I mean, let's imagine we're creating some kind of object model for this conference. OK, so we might start by creating a speaker object. And here, I've given the speaker a single attribute of age. For some reason, we want to know the age of the speakers. Now, age is just an attribute inside Ruby, and this is what I'm going to call the local state of this object. So when we instantiate this object, let's say we create a speaker to represent me, we're going to set the age to something. So we'll set to 21, because 21 is clearly my age, right? <laughs> so when I say we set the value of this age attribute, what I really mean is we create a reference to another object, and in this case, the reference is to a fixed num object. So we say fixed num is an object, and it's got this kind of state, local state of 21. Right? But this can't be a reference to another object. If it was, it would refer to another fixed num. And this would repeat forever. So there's something very special about the local state of fixed nums. Now, when I was recording the video for this, I said something along the lines of, you can't have pure OO numbers. And I think this is a really interesting observation. It's also completely wrong. And I knew it was wrong as soon as I said it. And I had to go back and re-record the video to ignore this issue. And this reminded me of a Sunday Mets talk. I thought, you know, I, I thought if this fundamental language, and it turns out you can take it out, and I thought you have to have, you can't have pure old numbers, you've got to have some special representation, and that's not true either. So I got kind of interested in how far we can take this idea, how far can we go towards creating a pure OO version of Ruby? Now, before I start looking at this, I just want to set some ground rules, because we all kind of understand what OO means, but we might have slightly different interpretations of it. So I'm going, to, I'm going to define OO in terms of four simple rules. There's only four things we can do here. Now, first of all, we can define objects. It wouldn't be much of an OO language if we didn't have objects. And when I say define objects, what I really mean is in Ruby, we can create classes, and we can add methods to those things. Once we define objects, then we can instantiate them. And we do this by sending the um, message new to our class. I guess, more specifically, we send allocate. It creates some memory, and it remembers which class it belongs to, so it knows which behavior it has. Once we instantiate objects, well, we can remember them. We can store references to them. And in particular, objects can store references to other objects. And then finally, we can send messages to our objects. And of course, our objects can send messages between each other. Now, when I said we can define objects, 
it's important to note that this has to follow the same rules. Okay, so when we're writing a method, we have to follow these rules. We can't just do whatever we want. We, have, we can only instantiate things, we can remember where they are, and we can send them messages. And nothing else is allowed. This actually cuts out an awful lot of Ruby. So for example, we can't use the built-in classes like fix num and string and array and so on, because these don't meet the rules. We also can't use nil, although to be honest, this is something of an improvement to Ruby. We can't use the built-in control flow structures like ace and case and logical ands and ors. And in fact, we can't use true and false because these also don't follow our rules. We can't use blocks or procs or lambdas. And this is really annoying because we can't use these handy methods like each and map and inject and so on. We can't use Ruby's built-in um, notion of equality because this doesn't follow our OO rules. We can't use puts, and in fact, we can't use any IO structures at all, because again, this doesn't follow our rules. And all this taken together means we can't use kernel. Pretty much everything in kernel will break our rules. And indeed, most of the standard library in Ruby will also break these rules. So can I still use Ruby? Well, yes, I can. All of the code you see is going to be Ruby code. It just might not be the kind of Ruby code you normally write. So let's get started, and let's start with numbers, because this is where I began. So how do you build a pure OO version of numbers? Well, there's not much we can do. Our rules are quite restrictive. But one of the things we can do is we can define objects. So we can start doing that. We might say, OK, we need the number 0. So we'll create a class for that. And then we might say, OK, we need the number 1. We'll create another class for that. And then 2 and 3 and 4 and so on. You can just imagine it's continuing forever. So this is kind of good because it follows our rules. But it also kind of sucks. And there are two big problems with this. The first is that there are an infinite number of numbers. So I want to build a number system this way, I would have to create an infinite number of classes. And that would make the most boring talk you've ever seen. <laughs> but even if we could solve that, even if we could all agree that we'll just use the first 10 numbers, we still have a big problem, because these are not numbers. These classes have got the same English name that we normally apply to some numbers, but that doesn't make them numbers. They don't act like numbers. There's nothing numberish about these things. So this approach doesn't work. So then how do we solve pure OO numbers? Well, it helps us step back a bit from the problem and think about what it is we're really trying to model. So I've written out some numbers here, the number 0 to 4. And you can just imagine the sequence continuing forever. Now, when I create some classes like 0 and 1 and 2 and so on, I treated these things as discrete objects. There's no relationship between them. But that's not how numbers work. There is a relationship here. In fact, these things are in a sequence. And this is kind of handy. This means that we have the notion of 0. We can use that to give a definition of 1. We can just say that 1 is the number that comes after 0. And this works for other numbers. For example, 2. We can say 2 is the number that comes after the number that comes after 0. And this works for all of our numbers forevermore. This turns out to be a surprisingly powerful concept. So let's look at how we write this in Ruby. OK, so I said we got 0. So I'm just going to create a class for that, and I'm going to call it number 0. And for now, I'm not going to do much. I'm just going to add an inspect method so you can see what's going on. OK, and inside here, I'll just print out the string 0, and that's it. OK, now inspect and the string that I give back are not actually part of my pure O language. I'm just putting them in here so you can see what's going on, so you can follow along. It means I can write things like number, ooh, write number 0, and then create that, and then run the code. And you can see it prints out 0. It's just a utility thing. I could remove all the inspects from the code at the end, and the code would still work. It just means that you can't follow along. OK, so that's 0. What about other numbers? I'm going to use a single class for that. OK, I'm just going to call it number. Now, numbers are a bit different. When I was talking about numbers like 1, 2, and so on, I always said they come after something, like 1 comes after 0, 2 comes after 1, and so on. So when I create these objects in the initializer, I'm going to pass in the thing that they come after. I'm going, to call it, I'm going to call this predecessor. I'll just store it in an attribute called pred for now. That's short. And then I'm going to add an inspect method here so you can see what's going on. And in here, all I'm going to do is inspect our predecessor. And then on the end of that, I'll just print a little dash so that you can see that this thing is here as well. OK, so we have some definitions. Now let's create some numbers. So we can say 0 is a new instance of the number 0 class. OK, and then we can say 1 is the number that comes after 0. And likewise, you can say 2 is the number that comes after 1. I run the code, and you can see this works. You can see it for 1, it prints out 0, its predecessor, then 1 dash. And for 2, it prints out the predecessor, and then 2 dashes. So this is kind of cool. This idea of being the number that comes after is something I use quite a lot. 
So I'm gonna create a helper method for this. Okay, it's called successor, or suck for short. So I've just got a, a method inside here called suck, doesn't take any arguments, and all this does is returns a successor, and the successor is the number that comes after this one. And we do that by saying number.new, and we just pass self into here. Okay, and I'm gonna add the same method to the order of the numbers as well. So like the successor of one is just the thing that comes after one, so it's gonna have the same definition. And then down here in our code, our definition of zero stays the same, but we can now use a shorter version for the other numbers, so we can say one is the successor to zero. And likewise, we can say two is the successor to one. And we can keep going with this as far as we want. So we can say three is the successor to two, and four is the successor to three. And then run the code, you can see this works. We have ways of creating three and four and so on. And this is already kind of cool. This means I've got two classes, I'm done here, and we can create this infinite sequence of numbers. So that's pretty good, it solved one of our problems. But it still doesn't really act like a number. We can't say this is a number yet, this is just an infinite sequence. So we need to add some behavior. And I'm gonna start with addition. Addition is a kind of fundamental concept with numbers. So how do we add two numbers together in a pure O way? This is kind of a hard problem, and maybe it's too hard to solve in one go. One of the things I like to do with a really difficult problem like this is find the this, this single simplest instance of that problem that I can find, and then solve that and see what I learn. Now, the simplest problem to do with addition I can think of is adding zero onto things. Okay, so we can create something that says, for example, zero plus zero. And we would expect that to give us back the answer zero. We all know how to add numbers together. And I could say zero plus one, and I expect that to give me back the value one. And I can say zero plus two, and I would expect that to give me back the value two. And in fact, zero plus anything just give me back that other thing. It doesn't modify it in any way at all. Now, not modifying a thing sounds pretty easy to do, so I can just go and implement that. I'll add a method up here to zero, called plus. It takes another number and then just returns it. It's just an identity function. It doesn't do anything to it. Go back to the code and run it. And you can see that this works. Zero plus zero is indeed zero. Zero plus one is indeed one. And zero plus two is indeed two. So that's great. What about other numbers? What about, say, one plus two? Or maybe two plus two? How do these work? Well, we can't use the same trick. We can't just say, we'll return the other number, because that's wrong. One plus two is not equal to two. We can maybe think, okay, one plus two is equal to three, that's a successor to two, so maybe we can just call it successor, but that doesn't work for two plus two. So how do we solve this? Well, again, it helps to stop. Take a step back and think about what it is we're doing. So here's the same thing as our original numbers. So here we're trying to add one onto two, and I don't know how to do this yet. This is pretty hard. But I do know something about the top line here. We've got the number one, and I know something about the number one. I know it's a number that comes after zero. And in fact, if we look at the predecessor of one, we would end up with this, uh, this addition, zero plus two. Now, the nice thing about zero plus two is, I know how to solve this. I know this gives me back the answer two. We've just seen this. That's kind of cool, but it's the wrong answer. But it's the wrong answer because I had to take a step back towards zero to get it to work. So I'm gonna balance that out by taking a step away from zero to get the final answer. That is, I'm gonna call the successor on the answer it gave me back. And that gives me three, which is pretty good because that's the correct answer to one plus two. Okay, so that's one. What about adding two onto two? Well, again, I don't know how to do this yet, but I can use the same trick. I can say, what's the number that comes before two? And this is the number one. And that's great because that gives us one plus two and we've just solved this. We know how to do this. This, is, it's, this gives us back the answer three. Now we need to balance this out again. We took a step back towards zero, so we're gonna balance it by taking a step away by calling the successor. That gives us four, which is the correct answer. And in fact, this works in general for adding positive integers together. So let's go and add it to the code. We go down to our number class down here. I can add a new method called plus, it takes another number, and all we need to do is add it onto our predecessor. Oops and then call the successor on the answer. Okay, if we go down, run the code, see it in action, you can see that this works. So we can now add one onto two, and we can add two onto two. Now, let's just stop for a second and look at this. All I'm doing is defining classes, instantiating them, remembering where they are, and sending them messages, and yet, just using this, we can rebuild a number system, and we can make them add together. I think that's kind of amazing. There are other, like, behaviors of numbers we might care about things like multiplication, subtraction, and so on. 
I don't have time to define them all here today, but they all work in a similar kind of way. Subtraction is a little bit tricky, but they all kind of work in this way, and we can rebuild a number system. There is one other behavior I want to look at before I move on, though, and this is the idea of equality. So I expect people to say something like, zero is equal to zero, and that should come back and say, yeah, that's fine, that's true. But if I say something like, well, zero is equal to one, I would expect that to come back and say, no, that's wrong, that's false. Now, a little bit of a problem. I don't actually have true and false yet. I need to go and build those things. So I'm just going to quickly go to another file and define them. We're going to come back to these in a moment. But for now, all I'm going to do is create a class called true. It's not going to have any behavior yet. It's just a placeholder for what it means to be true that we'll come back to later. For now, we'll just have the inspect method so we can see what's going on. I'll get to print out true. I'll do the same thing for false. Uh, I'll add an inspect method here, I get to print out false. Okay, and that's all I'm going to do for now. We go back to our numbers file, I'm just going to pull this class in. So this was in a file called booleans. So we can use it here. And then we can look at the idea of equality. I'm going to start with zero again. Zero is quite an easy thing to start with usually. So let's have the method called equals equals. And it takes some other number. How do we know if something is equal to zero? Well, it's kind of easy. If the other thing is also zero, then we know the two things are equal. So how do we know the other thing is zero? It might be kind of tempting to think, well, we can look at the class. But looking at the class is not one of my four rules. We can't do that. It turns out it's even easier than that. To know if something is zero, we just go and ask it. We say, are you zero? So we can say to the number, are you zero? And then we return whatever that gives back to us. Now, obviously, I need to implement this method. So for our number zero class, we can say, are you zero? And the answer is trivially yes. So it returns a new instance of the true object. Now, for other numbers, numbers that are not zero, the answer is obviously going to be false. So we can just add the method to here, called zero, don't take any arguments, just return to the instance of false. We go down here and run our code, we can see this works. Zero is indeed equal to zero, and zero is not equal to one. That's pretty cool. Let's look at the other numbers. So I should be able to say things like one is equal to one, and that would come back and say true. But if I say something like one is equal to two, well, I expect that to come back and say, no, that's false. OK, how do we compare numbers? Well, we can't just say, are you non-zero? Because that would make 1 equal to 2. That would be the wrong answer. But there's something interesting about looking at the quality of numbers. I can say that if two numbers are equal, then I also know that their predecessors are equal. So if I say, is 1 equal to 1, I look at the predecessor of both sides. I say, is the predecessor of 1 equal to the predecessor of 1, which is, is 0 equal to 0? And we know that this works. We can see the code above. And likewise, for 1 equals 2, well, we same thing. We look at the predecessor. We say, is 0 equal to 1? And we know this comes back as false. So actually, equality is pretty simple. If we want to know if two things are equal, we just look at the equality of their predecessors. So we're going to implement that. So this is the number class. We just add equals equals. They take another number in. And all we do here is we say, is our predecessor equal to the predecessor of the other number? Now, to make this work, I just need to add a quick uh, attribute reader method, which is pred. OK, but then that's it. I can go down and run the code, and it gives us the right answer. 1 is indeed equal to 1, and 1 is not equal to 2. That looks like it works. It's a bit of a problem. If I can say 1 is equal to 2, I expect to be able to flip that round and say, OK, is 2 equal to 1? And it should come back and say false. But when we run the code, it says, ooh, exception. It's all gone wrong. So what's happened here? Well, it helps to think through the code we just wrote. To, co to compare 2 to 1, I'm saying, OK, I'm going to look at the predecessor of both halves of that. So the predecessor of 2 is 1. I'm going to say, is that equal to 0? Now, to work with that out, we look at the predecessor again. We say, is the predecessor of 1, which is 0, equal to well, what? The predecessor of 0. We don't have a concept of that yet. And this is why it's breaking. So to make this work, we go back to our 0 class, and we add a new method called predecessor. So what is the predecessor of 0? Well. I guess we've got integers here, so we could say maybe it's negative 1. But we don't have negative numbers yet. We haven't built those things. And it would take me a little while, and actually it's quite unnecessary. The only thing I need to know about the predecessor of 0 is that it's less than 0. So I can just do that. I can say it's a new instance of less than 0. OK, and then we go back up here. Obviously, we need to define that class. So we'll define less than 0. The only thing I really care about here is equality. And the quality all works off by checking to see whether or not something is zero. So the only method I need to add here is zero question mark, and we just return false. 
So down here, on the code again, you can see this now works. We can check your quality. Now there's another little problem. If I say, is four equal to one? Run it, it blows up again, because it gets all the way down to less than zero and calls predecessor and that. So how do we define predecessor for less than zero? Well, again, this is actually quite easy. We could worry about things like, is it minus two? How does it compare to other numbers? But actually, I can just say that the thing, the predecessor of something that's less than zero is still less than zero. That's all I care about at this point. I can just return self. So in here, run the code again. You can see it now works. So equality is now working for us. And we put this together, it means we can write things like this. We can say one plus one is equal to two. I can run the code, and it comes back and says true. Now, this might look a bit funky because we've got this inline plus and equals, but actually it's just sending messages. It's just pure OO code. So for example, I can rewrite this by just sending the message plus, passing in the value one, sending the message equals equals to the result of that, passing the value two, run the code, it comes back and says true, as you'd expect, because it's exactly the same code. Now this is kind of amazing. We just rebuilt numbers in pure OO way. We don't need some prior definition of numbers or how they work. There are lots of other things in Ruby we could look at, but I don't have time to do everything. The thing I want to look at next is this concept of if. Now we saw this in Sandy Metz's talk, and she said we don't need if statements. And it's probably true, but I quite like having them. I'd like to be able to use some if-like construct in my, in my code. So how do we make this work? If you remember this Boolean class we had before, we've got true and false. Now, I would like to write some Ruby-esque code. I would like to say something like, you know, if true, then return the value one, otherwise return the value two, and then that's it. So I'm going to turn this into some pure OO code and get that working. Now, we can just translate this pretty easily. We can create a new class called if. We'll instantiate it. We'll pass in the concept of true. We'll say, OK, well, if it's true, then we'll return one. Otherwise, we'll return two. OK, so that's our pure OO equivalent of the Ruby code above. So we can chart that away now. We don't need it. So we need to define if. And how is this going to work? Well, actually, if is pretty simple to write. You can see that it takes a single argument. This is either going to be true or false. So I'm going to pass this into the initializer. And I'm just going to call it the conditional, the cond. And for now, I'm just going to remember it. The next thing we need is a method called then. And then it's going to take some kind of value. Now, if the conditional is true, then we want to return that value. Otherwise, we want to wait for the else clause. This is a bit of a problem. How do we write if when to define then we also need if? We get this kind of circular problem. It turns out it's really easy to solve. We don't solve it here. We just pass it down to the next object. So if just becomes a wrapper around the conditional. We just call then and rely on that to do the right thing. So this means we need to define then for true and false. OK, so inside true, we'll take a value. And if the condition is true, then that's the value we return. We should just return this. And it's kind of tempting to just say, OK, that's what we'll do. We'll return it. But if you think back to the example we had above, at the top of the file, we can see that after we call then, we then call else. So whatever we return has to respond to else. And of course, our value, in this case 1, doesn't return to else. It's not elseable. So we need to return something else that wraps up our value but lets us call else. I'm going to do that by just creating a new class. I'm going to call it true result. And I'm going to pass in the value that we were given. OK? Defining this class is really short. So it's called, ooh, it's called true result. It's got a single, oh, in the initializer, you can see we pass in the value. OK, so I'm just going to store that for now. And then we need a single method called else. And that takes an argument. But here, we don't actually care about it. This is a true result. So we're going to use the then branch. So the else branch, we don't care about. We just throw the value away. I will return the original value we were given. OK? And down here for false, we'll do the same thing. Obviously, the logic's going to be reversed. So we have then, takes an argument. We don't care about it. We'll return a new false result. I'll just define that quickly. There's no initializer here. We just need a single method called else. It takes a value. And again, it's just an identity function. It just returns that thing. OK. Take that away for a minute. So let's see this in action. OK. So here's our if statement that we built in our pure OO way. What I'm going to do is just look at the result of this, so I'll assign it to a variable, and then I will run the code and see what it produces. And it does the right thing. We say if true, then one, and one is what is returned, a zero followed by a single dash. And I can change this to say if false. 
and run the code, and you can see it now returns the else branch it returns to. So it looks like we solved if, but actually we're not quite done yet. It's a bit of a problem. And to see this, I'm gonna write a slightly longer piece of code. Imagine we've got some code, and inside it, we're storing something called a threat level. And during the execution of our code, this gets set to the value one. Now, based on the threat level, we want to decide some kind of action to take. So you might say, okay, our action is equal to, well, if the threat level is equal to four, then we're gonna launch some kind of preemptive strike here. So we'll say, we'll launch a nuclear missile. It's a bit extreme. Otherwise, well, this is a pretty crude piece of code. Actually, we'll do nothing. We'll just take no action. And then we run this code and we look at the result, and unsurprisingly, it says, okay, we take no action because our threat level is only one. Now let's write the same thing in a pure OO way. So again, we can set the threat level, but we'll set it to our OO version of one this time. And we can say the action that we take is equal to our new if construct. And here, luckily, we can say, is the threat level equal to four? If it is, then we'll launch our nuclear missile again. Nuclear missile is really hard to type. Never pick this for an example. Okay, otherwise, we'll take no action. So we need a class to represent no action. I'll just go and define that quickly. No action, uh, it's not gonna do anything. We'll just get it to print out something useful so we can see what's going on. Okay, and then this is our pure version. So if we look at the value of action when we run it, it's, ooh, what's happened here? It's all gone wrong. In fact, it says uninitialized constant nuclear missile. And that's kind of weird. It's like it tried to run the den branch. But we just saw that when the value is false, which is what comes out with um, one equal to four, that it doesn't run the den branch, it runs the else. So what's happening? Well, actually our if code is fine. It's something else going on here, it's Ruby's fault. Ruby's got this thing called eager evaluation. And when it sees a method call like then, and then some expression between the parentheses, it tries to be really helpful, and it goes and evaluates this thing for us, and it just gives us the result which means that even though we don't use the value for then, it goes and evaluates the nuclear missile code, and then we throw it away. And that's really not what we want to do. Now, normally you'd solve this in Ruby by using a block. You'd use a block to delay the execution, but I can't do that, I don't have blocks. So how do we delay execution here? Well, actually the answers are always really easy, there's not much I can do. What I'm gonna do is create a new class, and I'm gonna call this class option one. I'm gonna give it a single method called result. Okay, and inside here, that's where I'm gonna put my nuclear missile.new.launch code. And then that's it. And I'll create another class called option two. And again, I'm gonna give a single method called result. And inside here, this is where we're gonna do our noaction.new. Then we change the code in here. So rather than actually launching the nuclear missile straight away, we're just gonna create a new instance of option one. And then in the else part, I'm gonna create a new instance of option two. Okay. Now we run our code, it says, it says I've made a typo somewhere. Classic commands. Anyone got any ideas? <laughs> Something's coming as a fault. This is the thing I get all the time when I typo. Let me just delete that code. So class called option one, single method called result, and it says nuclear missile.new.launch, and then down here, a new class called option two, method called result, and it's gonna be no action.new. Does that help? No. Okay, I'm gonna skip over this bit. <laughs> Sorry? Not yet, it should give me back the option class first and you can call result on it. The line seven is gonna be a lie, it's somewhere else. The, these things are horrible to debug. Um, I'll just have typoed somewhere. Sorry? No, it's not result yet, I'm gonna call result if this works, I'll call it out later. Well, what's gonna happen is it's gonna give me back either an instance of option one or an instance of option two. 
And based on that, I'm going to have the wrong thing. So I would call results based on that and get the internal thing out of there and use that. Now, getting it, work, getting it to work isn't actually that important. What's really interesting here, I think, is we've had to stop and step outside of our pure OO model and think about the underlying thing. Think about what's happening behind the scenes. We had to think about the machine underneath us. Now, the machine in this case is the Ruby interpreter. And that's forced some constraints on the way we've written our code. Normally, I would say at this point, but it works. Obviously, here it doesn't work. But imagine it did. <laughs> OK, I'm going to move on from here. I'm going to look at something else. I'm going to look at strings. Now, strings are kind of a complex thing because they're actually two different concepts. OK, strings are lists of characters. So we need to solve lists, and we also need to solve characters. Now, I don't have time to do both. But I've already written a list class in, the, in a pure OO way. So I'm going to look at characters, because something interesting happens here. OK, so I'm going to want to create a character class. And what is a character? Well, it's really just a representation of some kind of thing that we see printed out. And typically, we use codes to represent this. And in this case, I'm going to use ASCII codes. So I'm going to add an initialize method here. It's going to take a code. I'm just going to store it in a variable for now. Then an the inspect method, I'm just going to inspect that code. Okay, and then that's it. That's all I'm going to do. So to make this work, or to use it, I can create, for example, the character H. And I said these are going to take ASCII codes. So the ASCII code for this is 104. And E, again, is going to be a new character. And this time, it's going to be 101. L is a new character, which is going to be 108, I hope. And O is a new character which is going to be 111. OK, so using this, I can now start to build a string. I can say a string is equal to list.new. Now, list is the pure OO version of list I built. And the way it works is you instantiate it, then you stick things onto the end of it. So I can just append h onto there, and then e, and then l, and then l again, and then o. And then we look at the string, we should see it say hello. And there we go. Perfect. That's not very useful, is it? No, it does work, I hope. <laughs> you can see I include this class called more numbers. That's because I needed to find some really big numbers. Okay, so I just called successor. This, this class, or this file, just really sucks an awful lot. But it does have some useful utility methods inside there. I can turn my pure OO numbers back into normal Ruby numbers by calling to i. Then I can call character inside there. And that's going to turn it back into the Ruby representation of the character. So if I run that, you can see it does print out hello. But to get that out, I had to cheat. I had to use built-in Ruby things that are not part of my OO language. We put it back to inspect. We get this horrible thing come out again. And this is not very useful. And this raises an issue about strings and characters, because they're not just representations inside the machine. They're actually things we use to communicate with the outside world. And we can't really talk about strings without talking about input outputs. Now, input output, if you go to Wikipedia, they give this definition of it. It says it's the communication between a computer and the outside world. I think this is a pretty good informal definition of I.O. Now, this does cause some problems for me, because it's got this concept of the outside world. Does this mean I need to model the outside world somehow? Well, I can't model the outside world, because it doesn't fit into my rules. It's not an object. And this means that I can't send messages to it. And this causes me problems, because it turns out that in a pure OO language, I.O. is impossible. It's impossible because it needs a concept of the outside world, and you can't represent that in a simple object. This makes me sad. And it makes me a little bit worried as well, because you know we've been doing pretty well so far. Well, in the run through, pretty well. We can do numbers, we can do some conditionals, we can do characters and strings to some extent. But we find out that we have a failure. We can't do input-output. And this raises an awkward question. You know, what else can we do in normal Ruby that we can't do in our pure OO version? Well, handily, the answer turned out to be nothing. There's nothing we can do apart from IO in normal Ruby that we can't also do in our pure OO version. And that's cool, but how do I know it's true? I haven't written every single Ruby program and converted it into my pure OO thing. And yet, I'm confident enough to stand here in front of 500 people and say, there is nothing apart from IO that you can do in normal Ruby that you can't do in this pure OO version. So how do I know it's true? It might be a good point to admit that this isn't really a talk about OO programming. It's about something much more fundamental, something much deeper. 
Now, to answer this question about how I could be sure there was nothing we could do in Ruby that we couldn't do in our pure old version, I'm going to go back and look at a question I skipped over earlier. I probably should have stopped and asked. I said something like this, you can't have pure O numbers, and I said this is untrue. And I knew this was untrue as soon as I said it. But how did I know it was untrue? Right? I've never seen someone build this kind of thing before, so how did I know it wasn't true? Well, there are two possibilities here. Either I'm some kind of crazy genius, I can look at the problem and think, oh, here's all the code that solves it, or I copied it. Which one do we think it's going to be? <laughs> genius or copy it? Ooh, come on, genius. No. It always happens. I never get to be the genius. It sucks. So I've seen it before, but where have I seen it before? I've never seen someone do this kind of talk before, so where have I seen this kind of pure O numbers before? Well, let's stop for now. Let's park this thought for a minute, take a little diversion, and talk about lambda calculus. Now, lambda calculus is one of these things that a lot of people find kind of scary. They think, oh, it's fundamental computer science. It's not for me. It's too hard. And actually, lambda calculus is one of the simplest things you'll ever come across. There are only three parts to lambda calculus, the three types of things you can have. So you can have variables, things like x and y. They don't have to be single letters. They can be longer than this. And these act like variables in your normal programming language. You can assign things to them. When you use them, it'll use the original value that you assign to it later on. Now, the next thing that looks a bit scary, these things called lambda abstractions. Look at this funny lambda symbol, and then a variable, then a dot, and then a body. Now, in this case, the body is just the same as the thing that comes before the dot. That doesn't have to be the case. It can be any other valid lambda expression in there. Now, lambda abstractions we typically take and assign to, to variables. So here we could say id is equal to lambda x dot x. OK, now, lambda abstractions actually are just functions. And we can write the same thing in Ruby by saying def id takes a single argument of x. Now, this is the thing that comes before the dot. Then the method body is everything that comes after the dot. In this case, it's just a simple x. OK, the final thing is lambda application. Now, this is two lambda terms side by side. A lambda term is just one of the three things we've seen, so it's a variable, it's a lambda abstraction, or it's another application. Application is a bit like calling method. It's a bit like calling the method t and passing in the value s. That's great. Why am I telling you all this? Why do we care about it? It turns out lambda calculus is really powerful. And we saw in the last talk that we can build lists with it, and we can also do some kind of Boolean logic with it. It can also do numbers. It can do all sorts of things. And in fact, lambda calculus is Turing complete which means that anything we can do in Ruby, we can do in Lambda Calculus, except I.O., because I.O. was a bit funny. I'm sure you're all very happy for Lambda Calculus, but why am I telling you this rather than shutting up and letting you go for coffee? Well, here's where it gets interesting for me. In our pure OO Ruby, we can implement the Lambda Calculus, which means it's Turing complete, which means it can do everything that Ruby can do except for I.O. That's pretty cool. I want to show you what I mean by saying it can implement the Lambda Calculus. So we had some lambda term. We had something like id equals lambda x dot x. Okay? I can mechanically turn this into some pure OO Ruby code. And the rules are as follows. When you say a lambda abstraction, this funny lambda symbol, I'm going to create a new class. I give this class the same name as the variable this thing is stored in. So in this case, it's stored in a variable called id. Now, I'll always create a single method inside here called call. This takes a single argument. In this case, I'm going to call the argument x to match the lambda abstraction above. And then the body just follows the thing after the dot, so I'll return an x. Okay, and that's it. That's how we convert it. Now, this doesn't just work for simple things like the identity function. We can look at something a bit more complex. So in lambda calculus, we could say true is equal to lambda t dot lambda f dot t. Now, you don't necessarily need to worry about why that's the case. I just want to show you that this is more complex, but we can follow the rules and convert it. Okay, so the rule says we create a class. We get the same name as a variable. It has a single method called call. It takes a single argument, in this case t, to match the thing above. Now, the body of this is a little bit more complex. Before, it was just a simple variable. We just wrote the variable name and carried on. Here, it's another lambda abstraction. But that's OK, because we have the rules. We just follow the same rules. Now, this inner lambda abstraction is not assigned to a variable, so I'm going to use an anonymous class inside here. Say class dot new do. Oh, OK, and inside here, we follow the same rules. We have a single method inside here called call. It takes a single argument, in this case, f. And then we want to return t. Now, we have a bit of a problem. As soon as we created the new class, we broke the outer scope. The outer scope is no longer available to us, so we can't just use t. So what I'm going to do instead is add an initializer inside here. I'm going to pass in the value t and remember it. And then down in our definition of call, we can simply return that value. Then we'll instantiate it straight away and pass in t so that it has access to it. OK, so 
this means we can write things like true.new, then we can call call on it. I'm just going to pass in the symbol t for now. Then we can call it again and pass in the symbol f, and hopefully this works. It'll come back and say t. This is the first thing we passed into it. Now, you might notice this looks a little bit similar to the way we defined true before. We could say true, then something else, something else. And that's no coincidence. These are both concepts of true. This is great. We can take the lambda calculus and turn it into pure or Ruby. And there's nothing special about lambda calculus. We can do this with other fundamental forms of computation, like Turing machines, or IOTA, or all these kind of weird things. I haven't got time to talk about all of them now, but if you are interested in this, I really recommend you read this book, Understanding Computation by Tom Stewart. He goes through a lot of these different forms of computation and how they're related. And all the examples are in Ruby, so you can follow along. Of course, you might not be interested, and if you're not interested in this, I recommend you read this book by Tom Stewart, Understanding Computation, because it's a really great book, and it may get you excited about it. So we can take Lambda Calculus, we can put it into pure OO, and now we know it's Turing complete. But a bit of a problem. Lambda Calculus is really hard to use. It's a very simple concept, but it's hard to get it to do things. So here's an example of 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. This is the same thing written out in Lambda Calculus. Now, we wrote this out in our pure o Ruby earlier, and this is the same thing, and it's horrible. I don't really care that it's long and scrolls off the page. What I care about is that I would hate to work with this. It's really, really hard to see what's going on. You get blinded by all these funny symbols on the page, and it's really hard to work out the intention. So much of the code is concerned with just trying to get the thing to work that the original intention of the code is completely lost. So when I wrote my pure OO version, I didn't just take lambdas and wrap them up inside objects. I translated them into better OO code. Because even though our pure OO thing and lambda calculus are computationally equivalent, they can both solve the same sets of problems, they're not equally expressive. A quick side-by-side -side example. We have the value 1 in lambda calculus. It's defined as lambda s dot lambda z dot s z. If we want to get the value 2, we use the successor function, which is lambda n dot lambda s dot lambda z dot s of n s z. OK? Now, I know this works, and I've tried this several times, but it's horrible. I would hate to work with something like this every day. We've got the same thing in Ruby. We can say, look, 1 is just the number that comes after 0, and 2 is just the number that comes after 1. And we get to feel, we get to feel very smug about this, because this is much more expressive. This is a Ruby conference, not a Lambda Calculus conference, so we get to be the guys with a great language. This feeling of smugness is nice, but it's also kind of fleeting, because it's not going to be long before somebody comes along and says, look, just use two. That's the right answer. All this thing we were doing with number.new is just a distraction. This happens all the time. We think, hey, we can use this really cool thing to solve a problem. I mean, it's confused into thinking, this means we should use this thing to solve a problem. And I think the reason we make this mistake so often is because we look at these things as systems of rules. And we think rules are there to be obeyed. We must always follow them. So in Lambda Calculus, I gave you some rules. For my pure o Ruby, I gave you some rules. And you think, I must follow these rules. But it applies to many things. It applies to things like the null object pattern. We think these are rules that must be obeyed. Or solid principles, we think these are rules. We must follow them. Or microservices, or whatever else. And they're not rules that we must follow. They're just tools to help us do a job. And they might not be the best tools for the job. We might be better off rethinking the problem and solving it in a very different way. And I do this all the time, and I catch myself doing it. And I go from thinking, hey, I'm some super smart developer. I can solve any problem in Lambda Calculus, to realizing that I'm just the worst kind of idiot. <laughs> I just don't know what's appropriate. So. I'm not saying you shouldn't care about Lambda Calculus and that you shouldn't try and build pure OO objects, because there is something really amazing about the computational power of Lambda Calculus. And I think there's something really amazing about the computational power of pure OO Ruby. I've practiced this talk so many times, and every time I can rebuild arithmetic just by sending messages, I'm amazed by it. I think there's something really amazing about the fact that Lambda Calculus and our pure OO Ruby have got the same computational power. By saying these things, what I'm really saying is that there's something really amazing about programming. Now, I learned to program a long time ago. When I learned to program, it was on one of these, Sinclair ZX Spectrum. 
And one of the ways you learn to program on these is you buy magazines. Now, you probably don't know magazines, but they're just like printed out things, like printed out web pages. <laughs> and you could flick through the magazine, and there'd be a programming section inside there. And it would have a description of the problem, and then a code listing. And this code listing's on the right here, and it goes on for a couple of pages. And what I would do as a kid is sit there and copy this thing out diligently, retype it all, and if I hadn't made too many typos, like I did earlier, I would run the code at the end, and it would do something, and I'd go, well, that's kind of cool. Then I go back and, and fiddle with it a bit, tweak it a bit. And initially, I'd do something kind of boring. I'd get it to print out like, hello, John, at the beginning. But after a while, I would do more interesting things. I'd change some of the values to make it work in a different way. Or I'd change the control flow. Or I'd take some statements out or put some new statements in. What I came to realize is that there's a few rules here that govern how this thing works. And once I'd learned those rules, I could use them to create this endless array of programs. This is an amazing thing. It means I can take these ideas, these things in my head, and I can follow the rules and turn them into code. I can feed this code into the machines, and the machines add electricity to them, and in that moment, they become alive, and in that moment, I become like Frankenstein, and these are my creations, and it is an amazing feeling. And it's the same idea. Let's just create the most amazing pieces of software today. <laughs> and the same idea that lets us touch the lives of thousands of people. And it all comes from these simple ideas. It all comes from following a few simple rules. And I think that this is part of what it means to be a programmer, to have this realization, to understand that the few fundamental relations being true, certain other combinations of relations must of necessity follow. Combinations are unlimited in variety and extent. Now, this is a quote from Ada Lovelace. It was written in around 1842. What I find really amazing about Ada Lovelace is not that she was the first programmer. I mean, anyone could have done that. It's that she realized this over 100 years before the first computers were built. She saw this fundamental truth about computing. She saw this fundamental beauty in programming and this power in what we do. And it's these ideas that got me interested in programming in the first place. And it's these same ideas, this fundamental truth about the powerful beauty of programming that mean I still love doing it today. My name is John, I've been programming for 25 years, and this is why I love programming. Thank you very much.